Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our meeting tonight, a committee meeting, October 5th, 2021. I'd like to welcome my fellow councillors, and uh, our deputy mayor is unable to be with us tonight, and uh, she has a family commitment. I'd like to welcome Colin McLean from the Journal Pioneer, and Nicola McLeod from CBC TV. Did I pronounce your first name correctly? Nicola. Nicola. Welcome. We have our acting CAO, Gord McFarland, with us tonight, and also our Director of Human Resources and our in-house lawyer. And we have our Director of Finance with us, uh, Kristen Dunsford, is with us tonight. And we have our engineer from Technical Services, Aaron McDonald, and Linda Stevenson from Technical Services. And we've got our Fire Chief, Ron Enman, and our Acting Police Chief, Sinclair Walker, and uh, members of the public in the audience tonight, welcome to our committee meetings, and members in the viewing audience on CBC. So welcome to all, and uh, we'll start the meetings, and I believe planning board is first again. Uh, Councillor McFeely, the floor is yours, sir. I thank you, Your Worship, and uh, we will move into the planning board and, and welcome folks. Um, uh, the planning board meeting, the agenda is attached. Uh, we, we would uh, ask for approval of the agenda with the removal of item number 1715 Water Street East that will not go forward at this time uh, to planning board. So the one item on the agenda will be uh, 129 South Drive, uh, the major variance application. So. With, uh, with that caveat, I would ask for approval of the agenda. Moved by uh, Councillor Ramsey, seconded by uh, Councillor Adams that the uh, agenda be approved as, as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary, motion carried. So we'll move right into the uh, major variance request for 129 South Drive. And the recommendation, this is supporting explanation the purpose of the major variance is to allow a proposed semi-detached building at 129 South Drive. The background, an application was received from Claire and Andrew Carr to allow a proposed semi-detached dwelling at 129 South Drive in the R2 zone. A semi-detached dwelling is a permitted use in the R2 zone, but the existing lot width does not comply with the required street frontage for a semi-detached dwelling. The report, and there's a map showing um, showing there the uh, the proposed uh, lots and, and, and site. The report, the proposed lot frontage for a semi-detached dwelling is 23 meters. The City of Summerside zoning bylaw states a minimum lot frontage of 26 meters is required for a semi-detached dwelling in the R2 zone. The applicant is requesting approval of a variance of 12 percent to the uh, lot. Frontage. Justification for variance. As required by Section 7.2 of the City Zoning Bylaw SS 15 2007, Council, Planning Board, and the Development Officer shall consider the variance against the following tests for justifying a variance. A. That the hardship is due to unique physical conditions of the lot or property, including small lot size, irregular lot shape, existing building location on the property, or exceptional topographical conditions which make it impractical to develop in strict conformity with bylaw standards. Exceptional topographical conditions may include, but are not limited to, trees, slope of the land, etc. Staff comment. Yes, this variance request would meet this test. The characteristic of the lot has impact on the requirement for the variance as the lot size is existing, not a newly created lot. B, that the proposed variance meets the general intent of the official plan. Staff comment, yes, this variance request would meet this test. The existing lot land used is residential. C, that the proposed variance meets the general intent of the zone. Staff comment, yes, this variance request would meet this test. The proposed semi-detached building meets the required front, rear, and side yard setbacks. The variance will not impact the required setbacks on existing neighbors. The variance impacts the semi-detached units only. 
D, that the proposed variance would not impact negatively or on adjacent properties or on the essential characters of the surrounding neighborhood, including taking into consideration any comments from neighbors. Staff comment, yes, this variance request would meet this test. 12 letters were delivered to nine neighbors, uh, nine properties within 30 meters of the boundaries of the subject property. The property is bordered by neighbors on the west, east, and north boundaries and the streets on the south boundary. Comments from the adjacent uh, property owners were due on or before September 21st, 2021. Written comments were received in the form of a letter and is included in this report. The letter was hand delivered to City Hall and was on sign. However, there is an address on the property, number 136 South Drive, PID number 68031. The letter is opposing front yard issues, whereas the variance being considered is for lot frontage. The author of the letter may not understand the terminology of the front versus uh, lot, uh, front yard versus lot frontage. The applicant is seeking a narrower lot, not that the building be allowed to be closer to South Drive. The city zoning bylaw provides regulations for the uses of land and location of buildings on a property. It is difficult for zoning bylaw provisions to take into account all circumstances such as pertaining to lot size, <coughs> lot shape, pie shape, lots, property line, yard setbacks, or topographic conditions, which may impact the development of a particular property. The hardship for a variance cannot be an economic one, but must be technical in nature. The size and shape of the property or design of a building project may prevent the owner from fully meeting all of the provisions of the zoning bylaw. In such cases, a variance is a me mechanism which is used to provide some flexibility, some degree of flexibility and discretion in applying the strict provisions of the bylaw. As a general principle, a variance must maintain the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw. It should never be used as a mechanism to circumvent or frustrate the intent of the bylaw. For example, a variance cannot be used to create a land use or a fully, or fully uh, eliminate a required yard setback. Any person who is dissatisfied by a decision of council or the development officer made under zoning bylaw may appeal to the Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission within 21 days of the decision in accordance with the Planning Act. Staff review, staff support the uh, lot frontage variance of 12% for a proposed 70 test dwelling at 129 South Drive. As per section 5.10, subsection B3 of the zoning bylaw, the planning board shall make a recommendation to council on this application before it is approved or denied. The planning board recommendation, whether carried or defeated, will be brought forward for council for a final decision. So the planning board recommendation, uh, the application from uh, Claire and Andrew Carr for PID number 68015 for a, a lot frontage variance at 12% be recommended to be approved by council. And before I ask for a mover and a seconder, I'll read into the record the letter uh, received from <coughs> 136 South Drive. Uh, attention, Linda Stevenson. This was uh, written on September uh, 20th, uh, 2021. Read the variance application. 129 South Drive, PID number 68015. And uh, point, point one, there has already been a front variance allowed on the front of the property which has brought things to a clo to close to the highway, safety-wise. So now the new variance would put the semi-detached dwelling three meters, 9.85 feet closer to the highway very dangerous. I know against this change. I vote against this change. Uh, point two, let's consider the snow, the st storms uh, about 95% of the time come from the north right down South Drive. Uh, that area at 129 South Drive always gets a lot of snow. The house that was there was a long ways back from the highway so the snow plow could shove it into the front yard, but in this case, uh, no front yard and can't put it further along into someone else's yard. 
the driveway. Uh, people don't want snow scooped up and put on lawns on the opposite side of the road. So that is the letter that was received there. And I, as, as pointed out in the, uh, in the uh, document, there was some, some misunderstanding of, uh, of the, the, the frontage piece. Uh, Councillor, no. Uh, just, I know it's not a ton of questions, but did we reach out to whoever this PID number is and get a name? Or is it common practice for us to read letters into on the record that we don't have a name for other than a PID number? Uh, did we confirm that it's an actual, and I assume, I, yeah. I'm saying it probably is. It's the first time in my experience hasn't it been is. a name attached to I, a letter. Never it is an actual person, that, and I'm pretty sure I know who it is, but I think there was a misunderstanding that the, the variance is for frontage. It's not, it's for side, right? Yeah. Side flankage. So yeah. the proposed uh, is no different than when we had done the rezoning. Yeah. And just to clarify, it's, it's not for side yard. It's for the total frontage of the lot. Yeah. Okay. And it's not how close the house would be to the side boundary. So it's how wide the actual front lot is. So how far is the house going to be from the street? The middle of the step back now is six meters, I believe, is the standard. 20, they could choose to go farther. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to get us into questions. I'm just saying, uh, I guess for procedure-wise, I don't know why we're reading a letter into the record without having a signed letter. I just, I've never seen that done before in anything, right. really. Yeah. Usually if you yeah. address a letter, it's signed by somebody and then it's in a... There's no well, address we it, it's a yes. PID number. I, I assume it's a oh. legit. I'm yeah, just saying we should right reach out and say, hey, is this whoever is that PID number, whatever, and make sure we're confirming as opposed to just putting it in the document. We don't know the location of that yeah, PID one, number. 136 South Drive. Yeah. I know who it is. Oh. They just signed it that way. Is it next door? Yeah. No, cross the street. Okay. Yeah. So can we maybe deal with the motion and then we'll open the floor to the... The discussions and questions. No, I, that's a valid point because I, I, I don't really recall seeing something before that wasn't signed. But, um, anyways, we do. Uh, the recommendation is the application from Claire and Andrew Carr for PID number 68015 for a lot frontage variance 12% be recommended to be approved by council. Can I have a, a mover and a seconder for that? Uh, moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Ramsey. Um, any Questions or discussion before we call the question? Not seeing any lights? You certainly may. Just uh, to Aaron, just that 12% variance, is that is that a normal, is that what we would normally allow? Like what, what is the range on that? Zero to 10 is usually by Zero staff. To 10. Oh, and 10 up to 50 is the maximum you can allow. Okay. So we're just over the 10 that staff, so it's 10 to, 50 comes to you guys through a process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we ju you. we're just over the threshold. Just over, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. So I just wanted to to let folks know that. Thank you. Anything else, Your Worship? Your light's on there, any oh, questions? I, I, ju I just want to get Aaron to explain. I, I said, it, you said it wasn't from the house to the road. It's a total, It was. it's supposed to be the side, right? But is there another explanation? So normally, this right. front lot right. here would be required to be 13 meters. Right. They're asking for it to be 11.5. Right. It doesn't change. The house still has to be a minimum of 20 feet or 60 20, 20, yeah. or 6 meters okay. from the street, and they still have to meet side yard setbacks that Perfect. are required under the Yeah, plan. and that's why I understood. I just didn't, the, the way it was said there. Okay, so it's been moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Ramsey that the application for Claire and Andrew Carr for PID number 68015 for a lot frontage variance of 12% be recommended to be approved by Council. All those in favor of the planning board say aye. Aye. Contrary. Uh, motion carried unanimously and that will go to Council at a regular monthly meeting on the 18th, I think it is. Six o'clock. Not sure of the 630. time. 6.30. 6.30, yeah. So, Your Worship, that concludes the agenda items for planning board. Thank you, uh, Councillor McFeely. Your Worship, oh, could I, can I ask to have the police services moved up next? Uh, okay. we, we just have some people here, and uh, 
if uh, I know they may. Sure, I think instead there'll be of waiting, approval from council to, could I to move it up to the next item on the agenda. Is that okay? That's a friendly amendment. Okay. Perfect. Sure. Thank so, okay. Councillor Ramsey, you have sorry, police and fire. Sorry and put you on the spot. No, that's okay. <laughs> no, um, yeah, that's fine. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, uh, Chief uh, Sinclair. Um, so, the first thing on the agenda is open fires. Nope. That's goes to have, so I'm going to go with West Drive speeding. Okay. <laughs> That's the second thing on the agenda because we brought, we brought police up first, so we'll go ahead and do that. And Bruce, I'm going to pass that over to you because I know that you put it on the agenda. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Uh, last month at the monthly meeting, I had uh, mentioned uh, uh, speeding, I believe, at the last monthly meeting. And I had asked to have some more uh, uh, presence on, I, there was two things. There was the speeding on South Drive and there was a child that came pretty close to being hit on uh, the crosswalks. I know we have another crosswalk put in there and it's operational now. Uh, South Drive is one thing, but uh, the main thing is the uh, speeding that continues on uh, West Drive. And I had asked for extra uh, patrols, and I know that they're doing their job. They're there quite often. In fact, I've seen them seen them quite often. I had to slow down quite often. No, <laughs> but anyway, I uh, I did meet with uh, Sarah uh, on West Drive, and I do have a petition here that she has uh, rounded up, and I will uh, present that to uh, Tech Services, the police police services. And uh, Sarah will have a couple of words there in a minute, but this uh, West Drive has been an issue for a long time. It, it uh, as it what used to be the main road through there, but uh, since the rotary has been put in, there's increased traffic. Uh, and I had asked to have the traffic counter, and I don't know if that had gone in yet, but uh, since the rotary had went in at the military road, uh, I went down there a couple of times over the last week or so, and uh, I would say easily, both times I was there, 60% of the people coming down the military road go through South Drive. Cars coming from the west didn't seem to be as much of a threat to come in, but trucks are. And I noticed that today I was out there again. Uh, there was a big lumber truck coming, and it was pretty easy to come around this way uh, instead of going, <coughs> going around the... Uh, so there, there definitely is increased uh, traffic. There is, uh, and with increased traffic, you're gonna have increased speeders. And uh, it's been an issue, and I've off and on, I've had complaints. I've dealt with the police department. They've always had the extra patrols there, and I think if you asked Anybody that's in the department, that's probably the sweet spot in, in uh, the city uh, for speeding tickets because it just seems to, and it doesn't matter what you're driving, uh, whether you're uh, on a motorcycle or a, a big truck, it seems. But I, I'm going to recommend that the 50 on West Drive from Briggs Street to South Drive be put down to 40. It's, it's, it's something that has to happen because they're just going too fast. Right now they're 50, you can go probably 60 before you're, before you're caught. And there's people that live along there, there's people trying to get out of their driveways, and uh, it, is, it is a big issue. The, the other thing that uh, is an issue is a lot of the trucks coming, I said, trucks, but not traffic, I should say. If they're going to the base, they're going back that way too. It's that set of lights down on the main highway from north and south. And I would ask the city to ask the province to review that intersection. Uh, there's no right turning lane coming from west. That's why most of the trucks are going through and up through West Drive. Uh, so I, I would ask the uh, the uh, department or the city 
uh, staff to look at uh, the recommendation of 40 from Briggs to South. And uh, I'm not sure if the calendar was put in there or not, but that'll tell us a lot. Uh, anyway, I will uh, let Sarah have a couple of words if you would like, Sarah. Yeah, just up here at the, yeah. Gary, you may have to turn that mic on. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Bruce pretty much said everything I want to say. Um, I think everybody knows that West Drive is a problem. I, I heard that he did a show of hands and that most of you cut down my streets as well. <laughs> we should have um, your name and address just oh, yeah. for the record, yeah. sorry. Pardon me? Just the na your name and address. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Sarah Boker at 100 West Drive. Right. Boker? Boker. 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 Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Um, so what's really important to us and everyone that signed the petition, um, we have a lot of families with young children on our street and um, we've just been there for a few years. I personally didn't know it was that busy. I didn't know people sped quite the way that they did. I might not have moved there had I known. Um, we put up a big fence in the backyard because I'm just scared of my kids running out onto the street. Um, it's day and night. It's not really a time of day that's specific to the speeding, um, but the traffic is insane during the day. Um, we also sat and watched sort of who was cutting down through the street just the last couple of weeks since talking to Bruce and like it's everybody, it's tour buses, it's potato trucks, it's mm -hmm. logging trucks, it's transport trucks, it's um, everyone pretty much coming from up west. I would say all my friends cut down there and um, until they knew that I lived there, they all admitted that they were going too fast. So um, it's, it's something to think about. Uh, the light was our suggestion. I know m my husband's even said the traffic lights there, they're timed really weird. I'm not really sure if that's why people are cutting down West Drive. If it's faster, it's easier. Um, the police have been great. They've been here the last week and there was actually somebody there all day today, so he can probably report how many tickets <laughs> they're given out today. I heard the sirens all day long. So we, we really appreciate that. Um, I know I've got some of our neighbors here who um, have issues as well with the trucks. We know this was brought up a lot at council with the ships coming in yeah. and the trucks coming um, through town. We fully respect that they need to be done in a timeline. We fully respect that it's, they need to be done overnight. It's the speed that's the issue. Yeah. They hit the end of South Drive and they just whiz past um, our houses. Um, I know my neighbors here, they live at the corner and their concern is when the trucks come to the end of South, they slow down to come around the corner and they speed up um, right around the fire hall. So. Uh, I know that's an issue. The police never seem to be around when the trucks are there. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's something that can be done as well, that on the days where ships there, that there's more police presence as well. The 40 is certainly a recommendation that everyone on the street's happy with. Yeah. Um, that might deter people from cutting down the street and it would hopefully slow people down as they come down the street. Okay, thanks Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, you're, you're definitely got a point. There's a problem there for speeding. The calendar was put down, by the way. Oh, it was great. And it was down from the 27th, uh, September 27th, 29th, that was for a 48 hour period. And uh, without going through the entire re report, there was about 46% uh, of the vehicles traveling west, who were 20 kilometers over the speed limit. Traveling west. So the, and, there, and traveling east, there was roughly 28.4. Was, was traveling east. Yeah. Over the speed limit. Oh, 20 over the speed limit. Same. Same. No, same. No, no. no. Okay, going. Go, okay. Yeah. okay, going east. Yeah. Okay. There was about 28.4% of the vehicles going over 20 kilometers. What would, when you say going over, was it possible some of them were doing 60? Or yes, over? possibly. Yeah. Yeah, actually, the, we. Oh, yeah. uh, we there was uh, actually 6.8% of the vehicles was going over 40 kilometers over the speed limit. Yeah. Hmm. 40 kilometers over. Over, yeah. yeah. So, so it, it is an issue. Oh, absolutely yeah. an issue, no, no question. We yeah. understand that. We, we did increase the, uh, the enforcement there. Just, I just got some numbers actually from September the 3rd, okay, until mm -hmm. today. 
And there was about there was about thirty five tickets wrote on that street. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, I believe that. Mm -hmm. Yes, September third. September third. Yes. Yeah. So yes, there there is a lot of enforcement there, and they got to realize every time they see a police car going by, we have radars in the cars, moving yeah. radars. So yeah, we're we're not just doing radar when we're sitting in the you know, on the side of the road. I know there's a mention of you know reducing the speed to forty kilometers. I don't know if that's going to do a lot of good. Personally, I think they're still going to speed. I think that one of the biggest problems there is that we're encountering is that it seems to be a shortcut from the highway. You know, it if, is, if you're it coming up to it, you know, you go and you see the, the lights say green there. Well, all of a sudden you take a left because you know you're going to run into a red. Yeah. I think that's I think that's a problem. And Bruce had brought that up as well. Uh, the West Drive is 40, so I I'm, I'm not sure why that shouldn't be 40. Mm -hmm. East Drive. East Drive. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, East Drive is a 40 kilometers. Yeah. So. That's why I think we should have that. It's a residential area. Yeah. We have uh, residential people. I don't want to speed bump there because I'd wake everybody on West Drive with yeah, the trucks, absolutely. the amount of trucks. So and sir, some of them yeah. at the speeds that you just gave me might take flight too. So, yeah. so Sergeant or Chief, if you reduced or if you went from 40 to 50, I think that's what's required. Or 50 to 40, 50 that's to 40. required. Yeah. And they still speed, but. That way, they'd be still. You said 48 percent of them were doing 20 or more. Yes. Going west. Okay, and and coming east yes. was 20. Not 20. 28. Yeah. Going east. Right. 28.4. So, so Bruce's argument or discussion or point of reducing it, I guess, you're suggesting not to reduce it. No, I'm not suggesting. Or, no, I'm suggesting it. I don't know what's going to do as much. But my point work. of reducing it is yeah. they're doing 50 now. They're probably doing in excess of 60. And if they're caught, yeah. they're probably, so if it's 40, I don't think they're gonna be doing 60 too many times. Yeah. They'll, okay, that's you know, point. you'll get your finger caught in the door a couple of times and you, you learn. Yeah. And I, I think that's what has to happen. And, and uh, I agree with you as well on the, on the fact about the road humps or the, or the, or the speed bumps. Yeah. I mean, that's just gonna be, you got a lot of truck traffic there, it's gonna be just increase the noise. It's annoyance. Espe especially for the at night, you know, when they're hauling gravel yeah. and so on and so forth. Whose now, house do you put it in front? Yeah, yeah. So exactly. It's, it's yeah. A speed limit. Now, now we, do, we, do have, we do have an additional uh, a speed ra our radar sign, right? Right. Speed radar sign. Yeah. We had bought three last spring. We only put two out. So okay. we do have one of those. So we could install one of those traveling west to start with. Yeah. So if the speed That's limit is. Okay. Sorry. If the speed limit is reduced to 40 and they still drive 60, you'll end up getting twice as many speeders, maybe. But the idea is yeah. to slow the traffic down. Well, eventually it's yeah. gonna slow them down. Let's hope. I, I, think, I think that speed sign will make a, a huge difference, eh? Do you find that they, they I think so, yeah. I know, well, it affects, I know it affects me every time I see one. Well, <laughs> well I'd, certainly, I'd certainly like to try that, but if yeah. it doesn't work, I'll, I'll be back with the request to reduce it to 40. Is that fair? That's more than fair. Sarah? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, we will. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the there. presence there and try the speed radar sign. Yeah. Maybe once we get the radar up, yeah. Yeah. Once we do and then get the, the, tech service. Get the testing, get the, the, an yeah. the, an yeah. Okay. Yeah. the analysis. Yeah. The analysis done again, and then you'll yeah. be able to compare a little bit and add some okay. data whether yeah. So if the people are here to request that the speed be lowered, and I think that was the request. Yes. So I guess uh, the speed limit is not being adhered to, and we, I, in discussion, I, I think it should be down to forty. Well, that's just a simple resolution of council, isn't it? But are you going to try something else in the meantime? I'm, I'm open as long as we can slow the traffic down. Well, I think, I think Gordon had a good, uh, good suggestion there. Once, once we put that speed sign up, we have it, on, we have it now. Right. And then do another count. Okay. And see how it's working. If it's not working, then we'll go as you suggested. So then we'll reduce yeah, it to Reduce it and go from there. Not bad. So if it's just a matter of changing a few signs, why don't we just make it the same as East Drive? I guess I just, why, why wait? Why not just do it? Yeah, why, it's why don't we change it to 40 yeah. and put the speed sign in anyway? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I think West Drive would be considered a collector street. And I mean, council street. I mean, you know, you make a recommendation and then to yeah. council, and council yeah. 
as the mayor pointed out, you put a resolution on the floor, do whatever you want, yeah. right? But you, you may want some analysis in comparison to other collector streets in the city, or you may, you know, like it. Um, it is definitely goes through residential area, but it's not. I think Aaron, it would be deemed a collector street. Is that correct? I think it was as collector, but well, south is a collector, is it? Uh, yes. No, it's an arterial. Uh, no, what do you call it? South. Yeah. So and that's forty. No, south is fifty most of the way. Most there, of the way. Yeah. There'd be a number of streets in Summerside that have residential housing on them that are fifty. It, that's my only. Point. When you say most of the way, just clarify that. What's McEwen Road? Uh, fifty. And then the school zone. Just drops on the school zone. And I mean, unfortunately, most of the literature would speak to that what you set the speed limit at doesn't really affect that much what people drive at, right? People drive at what they believe is a safe speed for their surroundings. Can I ask a question now? I'm just wondering, South Drive, if, if it's whatever it last has. Why wouldn't the speed limit be the same all through South Drive? What's the no, reason for No, we're talking West Drive. I know we're talking West Drive, but South Drive, you said some of it is 50 and some of it is 40. School zone. School zone. School zone. No, and I think it slows down there once you get to uh, Water Street, too. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, the yeah, it's 50 all the way in until you get to the apartment down here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a four. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So South Drive is mostly is 50 other than the school zone. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just going to say, I'm, yeah, I have no problem supporting the speed change or whatever with uh, houses being on there, but I really like the idea of uh, going to the province because I, I really think, like your husband, I think not having that turning lane, dedicated turning lane, yeah. people use that as a shortcut. I, I, I use it as a shortcut, no doubt about it. I've I seen him to going today. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. <laughs> when I when I used to work west, especially, that was the way in it. Just you didn't have to wait for the light. So um, I think it's that we would look at it. I don't think I spent a whole lot down there, but I, I definitely think it's definitely a shortcut and it, it would be uh, helpful to look at that. And that um, light, that will look better than the one that you always use. No, it really is. It sits there for almost five minutes. <coughs> it's a deterrent itself, just at the length of the light, so I don't know what we can do about that. But so, Madam Chair, so is there a petition that you have... Uh, I have a petition here. Requesting yes. that it be lowered from 50 to 40. The, I'll read the petition. We, the undersigned citizens of the West Drive and the City of Summerside, draw the attention to the City of Summerside Council to the following that the amount of traffic on West Drive continues to increase and the speed limit of 55 is not being adhered to. There are many young families on the street with children who play here and travel by school bus. Both residential and truck traffic are driving dangerously and above the supposed to be above the posted speed limits at all hours of the day and night. Cars are frequently passing and those who do not adhere to the speed limit. Therefore, the petitioners request the City of Summerside Council to provide a solution that is more effective than the daily police patrolling that does not seem to be deterring drivers from speeding. So there wasn't a request to reduce it? No, I had, I, in conversation after the meeting last, uh, yeah, I suggested that maybe that's an issue and uh, that we can deal with. Uh, if, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to wait for three or four months. Uh, if we put the speed sign up and we left it at 50 with the flashing radar and we left it at 50, uh, how long would we be before we have a review on the speed two months a month you have to take service I guess yeah I, I would think you want it within a month or so Not within a month enough. within a month so I would I, I think well I just think what I wanted to say in, in fairness 50 is not fast if the, if the cars were going 50 everybody would be happy that isn't the issue right that, that's right. Like that's that's so we're we're making that an issue, but that doesn't seem to be the issue. The issue is the speeding, and maybe I think the chief's recommendation is really good that they put the the 
the cam well, it's not a camera, but it's a, a radar detector. Speed, radar speed it's, yeah, a speed. And, and just, see, you know, because 50 is a pretty normal speed. It's just that they're speeding. Yeah. I don't think it's going to matter what we put there. They're going to continue to speed unless we have something that's visible to folks. And maybe yeah. I think it's worth trying that. Could we ask that the speed uh, radar go up and we put in the, uh, we get the results after the, like yeah. we get the yeah. results yeah. next yeah. month. And uh, if not, I'll have it on a, 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 a what's this, the November, Right. Yeah. To, uh, increase see, see the the to increase the 40. Yeah. To increase the what? To decrease the speed to, to 40. The if it's, the increasing the well, we're going to get the information yeah. before the November meeting. Okay. And if it hasn't corrected itself, then we'll put a motion through to reduce the speed limit to 40 on West Drive. And, and the other thing I do really believe is that that is a, a, a road where people do speed. I don't know unless there's going to be a police, a police presence there sort of on a regular basis or dropping out there unknown uh, to the folks that, you know, that's the only way. It's, it's, it's like when Maxwell was yeah. there, right? There was no speeding in St. Elmer's because they're always aware that there's going to be police around at certain times. And, and I mean, we're really looking at our speeding and and police services are doing a great job. And, yeah. and I think we're targeting that area right now. And, yeah. and I hope that, um, that it works. See, and we almost need, you know, I know we only have one, but if they're speeding going east and going west, uh, you know, we're with so the radar. Could I, just a final question, Madam Chair? Absolutely. That, uh, uh, I believe the can or Councilor, Chief Walker, you mentioned the number of tickets in the last couple of weeks, 38 to one. Yeah, so since September we wrote 35. 35. 35. And today? And, still, and that today? today? Today, I think there was about 10 wrote there, actually. <laughs> but, but, no, but what I'm saying is, even with all of those tickets, it hasn't slowed the traffic, is what no. you're saying. No, and, we're, and our guys are there all the time. I mean, they're there most times, and we get free, don't get me wrong. No. But uh, there is you a have lot to be other places there, as well. Yeah, there is a lot of presence there, and uh, yeah. there's been more this week, and, and uh, no, we appreciate that because. Anyway. Yeah. What, what is the traffic numbers okay. on that street? Like what, are, are they significant? Like obviously there's a lot of, like heading to Slim Park, heading out, like just, that's probably a real. Well, there's 1,300 over a four-day period. 1,300. 1,300. And how's that compared to other, I'm just sort of curious, like how would that compare to. I don't know. But those yeah. speeding, those, those percentages speeding. of yeah. over 20 and over 40 yes. are definitely uh, some uh, of the highest yeah. that we have when we, uh, anywhere in the city with the mm -hmm. county. Right. right. Thanks. Will the yep. speed bump be too noisy? With so many trucks there? Just be so, too disturbing. Uh, yeah. I, I got a question because I believe most of the speeding is coming going east. When they come around from the... 28% is, is coming east. The numbers just show us the numbers. The other way. They're going the, the other way? It's the other way, yeah. So They're when you come off of South Drive, is come that what you're saying? South Drive, yeah, traveling west. Yeah. It's both. It's both. Going west is worse. Yeah. Quite a bit worse, actually. What the numbers are. Going west is worse. Oh, yeah. I had it the opposite way. Well, I would have had it the opposite way. Yeah. Anyway. But just on the speed bumps again, I know in other areas of the city they put speed, the neighbors requested speed bumps and they were put in. But out there with so many trucks going from the, no. from, it would be too noisy. Mm. Right? Yeah. Pardon? Definitely you wouldn't want it in front of your house. No. I wouldn't want no. it in front mm. of mine. Okay. No. So, so counsel. In front of Curtin's, like right in front of there. But that's too far down, eh? Well, no, They're not in the residential. Sorry. The only thing I'm thinking, well, that's why I asked about the number of cars. If you put it down in Kearns, it might divert some of that traffic that you're trying to, you know, if you have to hit a couple of speed bumps to get through there, you might say, yeah. oh, I'm going to go the other way and wait for the light. But I, I'm not saying that's an option. I'm just saying it might deter the traffic from cutting through. Yeah, yeah. Greg has... Um... Oh, I just don't want to rain on the parade, but... We got our police force way out in St. Helens there. I know Mr. McFeely and myself have two schools on McEwen Road and we'd like to have that monitored fairly closely too. I got numbers already done two years ago, I think, and again last year on Craig Avenue. And they were every bit as high as those numbers are there. And I 
heck will have more traffic around. So uh, be careful. Let's not forget about some places and spend all our thoughts on on another place. Yeah. No, I don't think I don't think we do that, Councillor Campbell. No, I think that, that, I think we're just tra we're just talking about a specific yeah, area this evening. One thing that does work very well is Tech Services does the speed counts and gets yeah. all the information. That's all that's shared with the police as yeah. soon as we get it, yeah. which helps the police determine yeah. where the yeah. highest yeah. priority areas are to yeah. enforce that speeding. Works. Right, so that works pretty well. And okay, Craig, so what I'll do is oh, sorry, Greg. With Craig, we had the same thing. We we thought it was the traffic was going that way. It was the traffic that was coming back from McDonald's. McDonald's like going back to school. Speeding, so. Yeah. Madam Chair, with the lady that made the presentation, would you want to clarify anything or after I, 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 I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Ye
is um, I think Councillor McFeely had some concerns regarding open fires in our city, so I'm going to um, pass it on to you, uh, Councillor McFeely. Thank you, Councillor Amjad. I'd like to Councilor. pass along the sympathies to our chief. We lost one of his firemen yesterday. Yes, yes. yes. Mr. Very Mr. Very 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 sad, yeah. yeah. Too young. Much too young. So. Anyhow, um, yes, I asked to have this on the agenda. It's really as a result of uh, an inquiry, not just the one inquiry that, that um, I, I had a few weeks ago, and I, I committed to that person that I would bring the concerns to council, but, but uh, I, I don't want to kind of leave the impression that we you know, bring things to council just when there's, there's sort of one concern out there, but, but, but I've had many concerns over my time on council and they're all kind of similar. And I know we've looked at the, the bylaw uh, in the past and um, uh, so the concerns that are raised are really, and I don't know if other councillors are hearing any concerns, so that's why I brought it forward. I don't know if other councillors are are, are hearing anything and uh, um, the concerns that I hear are, are really related to you know people that you know don't want to get into a neighbor to neighbor kind of confrontation over a fire or a discussion over a fire but they're dealing with the smoke coming into their houses, having to close their windows in the heat of the summer and those types of things. I just thought this is a good time of year to have this discussion when it's not, when it's, uh, you know, we're at the end of the season here. So just want to get a feel for whether any other counselors had been hearing or receiving any comments or, or, or issues. Um, and then I wonder, as I thought this through a little bit, you know, we, we really have no sense of, you know, how, how many fire pits there are in the city. Um, we don't know if they're constructed within the, uh, in, in compliant with what we suggest is an acceptable uh, fire pit, uh, where they're located on people's properties and, and those types of things. So, um, and I, I really just want to get a sense whether other councillors have had any uh, concerns or issues expressed to them? Um, is there anything here that, that perhaps we can take another look at here? Uh, and then I wonder about if, you know, if the elusive bylaw officer ever gets in place, mm -hmm. is this something, you know, I, I really don't think it's good use of the chief's time to be out monitoring fires and dealing with, with um, um, you know, backyard fires and, 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 and that type of thing that uh, is this something that the bylaw officer can become more uh, engaged with to ensuring that whatever people are doing is not infringing on neighbors and that type of thing so so that's why I, I, I asked for it to be on the agenda nothing more than to uh, I, I, you know committed to bring it forward and, and have done so uh, and just want to get a sense from others whether they share the concerns and if, if council as a whole thinks that there's something here we should be exploring a little further, then that's great. If you just don't, that's, that's, uh, then we, then we move on type of thing. So, um, that's why I've said my piece. I'd, I'd really like to hear from other counselors, whether, uh, whether they see this or have heard, whether they've heard anything, uh, any complaints or any issues, uh, that, that type of thing. Cause I've often, Often you hear them, but they're not passed on, and they're not, uh, you know, the, the, the people yeah. wouldn't be aware of it, so. Thank you, Councillor McFeely. Um, I've had two. I, I think Corey had Sorry. his light on there. I, uh, I, I can say that I've definitely have had some people reach out over the last three years with some concerns. Uh, not many, it was minimal, and it would always be forwarded to Rob, and Rob would have either the chief or police out to, uh, look and check in on it um, but also on the other side I've definitely when I think we've had this discussion previous through some other committees it had come up and and I've also heard people say you know it's great to be able to take my kids out and have a fire in the backyard so it's finding that you know balance, uh, balance of 
what's acceptable and what's not. And I would agree the elusive bylaw officer. I'd probably love to see that eventually get into place and, and make sure that people that are utilizing backyard fire pits and doing it are doing it in accordance with their bylaws. So uh, I, I think overall, I think it, from my understanding, it works well and there's those one-off issues. And I totally understand what you're saying. It's hard for neighbors to address neighbors and nobody wants to be in a dispute with their neighbor on the other side of the fence. So we need to do what we can on our end to sort of help smooth out those one-off issues that come to uh, come to each of us and make sure that they're handled appropriately. Thank you, uh, Councillor Snow. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Yeah, that's funny. I have had two complaints, I think, in the seven years I've been in council, and both of them were from wood burning stoves, not the back at all. And, and, and you notice in the, the, the night when there's no winds and stuff like that, it can get fairly strong. I know we live they live on wood burning, fuel burning you know, on Collin Avenue, and it does make quite a, quite a smell through the neighbors' homes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Campbell and um, Councillor Duran. Thanks, Councillor Ramsey. I guess just uh, in the interest of collecting data, uh, not once in the last three years have I been contacted about anyone being bothered by smoke or, or having fires or anything. So I guess that can be seen as a good thing because I know there's certainly lots of people in the area that I represent that, that have them. So. They're either following the right rules or everybody just seems to not mind them, but uh, just thought I'd pass that along. And you'll be in the firefighter too. <laughs> Maybe that's why they, they're being good, I don't know. But yeah, no, I haven't received any complaints since I, I was elected to build fire, so that was either before or after we enacted the, the bylaw, or, so just worth noting, I guess. Thank you, uh, Councillor Duran. Councillor Adams. Um, I've only had two in the whole time. Uh, one was on Duke Street and one was in Bruce's Ward and I wasn't sure of the exact address, but those were both passed on. So right. those are the only two that were ever brought up to me. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Adams and uh, Councillor McDougall. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, to sit here and not say nothing uh, would be wrong. I did have a complaint in my ward and uh, it was passed on to city. City has dealt with it and uh, Anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, Councillor McDougall. And I guess there's, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I just want to um, say my little piece as well. I've had one complaint in the last three years, and then I had one complaint from Bruce's ward, um, and that was dealt with. Um, but. <laughs> But I, but, and, and the one that I had was dealt with and that was um, a year or more ago. And what I do wanna say is every time there's a complaint, our chief is on it. And um, thank you very much for that, um, Chief Inman. And, um, and I know even the situation with uh, Councillor McFeely that you're, you've been in great communications with that situation as well. And, and um, thank you for that. I just want to say one thing on the bylaw officer, folks. We were right there, okay? We were right there, chief, <laughs> uh, police. And anyway, it all didn't happen. That's okay. We're working at it again. We're trying to, we're trying to get there. So um, because, yes, our chief of police and our chief of fire have uh, way more things to do uh, than to deal with uh, these types of things. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to the chief. Yeah, I was just going to say, just in oh. regards to that, when you say we're right there, oh, I, we guess I had a person in place, but the person uh, was uh, took another position someplace, and that's what happened. They did, and and you know, and and that's all understood. But we're we're working at getting this aligned up again. And um, thanks everybody for all your hard work in that. And it's, it's important, I guess, for the residents to know that we continue to work on it. It's just not something that's happening easily for us. So um, did you have something, uh, Gordon? Just on the fire um, rec recommendations that we have. So just, just so we'll make sure we're clear on the record, we currently do not have a bylaw that speaks, that regulates backyard fires, right? Right. Previous councils, almost every previous council that I've been involved with has 
give it thought and and have decided we have guidelines for those. Yes. We, we, we have decided not to enact the bylaw, but I think the last council asked that we create guidelines and, and instead of using regulations, basically use education as the right. as a tool. So we do produce guidelines that are shared during the start of the summer and throughout the season. Right. And then, um, you just like you said, the chief does uh, respond to complaints. Um, yep. That being said, even without a bylaw that speaks directly to backyard fires, we do have bylaws that are able to be used in the instances where there's danger to property or danger to or, or nuisance of that type. Right. Of and those guidelines, we did go over those at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the summer here, maybe April or May. We talked about them before we got into the summer, so everybody was on the same page. And I think our um, uh, staff sent out all, all sorts of information, either through Facebook or Summerside page and whatever. And uh, thank you, Gordon. So Chief Enman, is there anything that you'd like to um, just kind of enlighten us with? You mic's off. Yeah, I think education is the key. I mean, last year we probably had over three dozen complaints about smoke and, and, and neighbor, neighbors having uh, backyard fires and stuff. And I mean, every time I visit, it's uh, just go over the guidelines and everybody's usually pretty good. Uh, this year, it's, it's quite a bit less. Any phone calls that are directed to me from dispatch or via email, I, uh, if it's through dispatch, I usually go out immediately just talk to the homeowner and as far as the emails I just give them my phone number and the next time it happens I go out and it, it usually goes well yeah. I, I think the last thing we want to kind of people do enjoy being in their backyards and with the children or grandchildren and I think if they know the rules they're usually pretty compliant yeah. that's, that's my take thank you very much chief uh, Edmund. And so, Brian. Feely. So, just to close this off from, from my perspective, and first of all, I, want to, I certainly want to thank the chief and, and, and recognize his <coughs> efforts in, in this. And I agree 100% that education is the key, and it certainly wasn't my intent tonight to, uh, to in any way, shape, or form, put the kibosh the backyard fires. Uh, I was asked to bring it forward, see if there was any appetite from council to review things. What I'm I think I'm hearing is that it really hasn't been an issue for council, mm -hmm. and um, you know we certainly respect that. So, um, uh, as I said at the onset, I just thought it was a good time to have a discussion when you weren't in the, the, the heat of the season, so to speak. That, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and we've had that, and uh, uh, certainly accept that the status quo is how council would like to continue to proceed. So, uh, case closed. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Councillor McFeely. Thank you very much, and thank you, Chief Enman, for coming in, and uh, Chief uh, Police over there. Thank you very much, Sinclair Walker. Thank you. And with that, I will adjourn this. Committee. Thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Okay, we're back down to Tech Services, I believe. Next, we bounced around there for one, but we're Councillor Drawn. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thanks very much, Your Worship. Um, you. One item on tech services this evening, um, and that is uh, a discussion on the crosswalk on McEwen near Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, of course, is the new street. I think one of the two new streets up north McEwen where the new uh, row houses are built up near Craig, actually. Uh, not sure who, I'm gonna assume it might've been Councillor Campbell that may have wanted this on the agenda, or no? Carrie? It was uh, Councillor Adams. Okay, well, we'll uh, sorry, I assumed it was the Councillor of the area. It's all right, Greg had put it, Councillor um, had put it on before, and um, then somebody just in passing had mentioned it to me, and I said that I would put it on and speak to it again. The problem that we have up here, the Greenway, uh, housing up there, there's 50 units that come out onto McEwen. Plus, we got the new subdivision up there with 160 units that were going to dump out onto McEwen. And that's why I was kind of suggesting that 
that we wait until we get the, the big 160 development done and because we, we can't have it coming out of there, there are separate streets on there's two separate streets on the greenway and another one on the other one's so it'll rather be three yeah so we'll have to narrow it down to one yeah. crosswalk i would think so and yeah just so just so anybody Either that or, or bring them down to craig we're just yeah yeah so just so that. anybody watching or listening understands there's no sidewalk on that side of the street now <coughs> so you have to cross in across the traffic there's nowhere to get to the sidewalk without cro jaywalking, right? You, there's no sidewalk on that side of the street. So you have to walk down along the ditch or the side of the road to get down to Walker or, I don't know, is there even one up at Athena to get across? So that's, that's the issue that the seniors that brought it to my attention when I was at something the other night, they had mentioned it and they said that um, Councillor Greg had brought it forward before too. And then um, he chatted with me before this meeting and he indicated that um, he had mentioned to tech services and it was sort of I, all I going don't know to if be- a sidewalk answer or not? I don't know. Yeah, it's like we have the two and then we don't, don't have a cross to yeah. go up on. The thing with the new development that the current row houses that started there now they, is that they they're set a, back at least, yeah. right? So there's a little bit of extra road there as opposed to these these ones around Elizabeth. There's there's no there's no side of the road there. It's I think Aaron's aware of that. Yeah, yeah. So anyways. So yeah, that latest developer did that themselves. Yeah. They uh, widened the streets and, and allowed, yes, it's gonna be a wider shoulder from the walk on, but as you know, Yes, in this instance, we have a number of, uh, you mentioned probably four or eight buildings in there, but on all these other streets, except for downtown, we only have a sidewalk on one side of the street. It just happens maybe not on that side of the street, but in other areas where, say, halfway down Granville Street, we'd only have, if anybody's on the opposite side, they either have to walk up a short distance on the side to get to an intersection to cross at the intersection, or in this case, it's going to be mid block between Craig and, and Ryan. So we're it was brought out whenever we're dealing with, I think it's called Foxland, whenever that develops or gets more density or develops that we're probably gonna have a need when you do the crosswalk warrants to uh, warrant a uh, crosswalk probably at Craig and Foxland, that intersection perhaps, but there's still, we don't have sidewalks everywhere, it's on both sides, so at, they're gonna have to walk on the shoulder. In that case there, that developer just did a private development that was along a ditched area. Now the last current developer wide ditch for their for their developers or surf for their units that people can walk on the shoulder paved shoulder to get to uh craig avenue at least to the intersection or walk all the way down to walker if there's a crosswalk at walker now, they're, the, they're actually jaywalking now to get across the yeah. Yeah. It, yeah and i would say around town everyone is that there's not unless they walk to the corner like you know that there's only a sidewalk and only downtown water street the commercial areas where we have sidewalk on both sides of the street we come up maybe one block or so from Water Street. Like on Victoria, there's the one like on Victoria West, I guess it would be. There's a sort of a sign there. There's no crosswalk painted, but it's midway. There's no intersection there. It's and that's the one that was on the list to come out. It's in poor shape, but we had it on the list to come out. There, that was there years ago and it was brought down. So whenever the sidewalk was replaced on the north side of the street, it was brought all the way over, I think, to our cone or our high so that they would cross right at the intersection. And we said whatever that section got deteriorated, we would take it out. So we had that on our list uh, this past year, but it fell obviously for other priorities, but yeah. Anyways, we said we'd bring it forward so that it would stay top of mind whenever they're being done. So, cause there is, there's some elderly people that like to get out for their walks and it's a little more safe sure. for everybody involved. Yeah, pretty near a dozen of walk here. Yeah, multiple times, so. So Greenway development's not that old, right? When was that built? The yellow, the yellow yeah. low ones. Low ones. Uh, how, how many years ago was that built? Ten. The northern ones were built first. The last ones were built maybe in the last three to five years. The first four, unit, four, four buildings were probably built 10 or more years. And then the next four got built in the last five perhaps, but we can look it up. But it's, and I might, I might be confusing something here, but I'm, I'm curious, is the issue 
I don't know what the issue is, like sidewalk and crosswalk, but the fact that there's a ditch in front of the greenway, that's causing the issue, right? Because it's not. They're not walking on a air. They're walking on a shoulder of the right. section of road. So, yeah. so yeah. do we not? I thought we had something where the developer was supposed to fill it, or is it because it's off the road that they weren't required to? They were building on a on a road that already had an existing street. They didn't put the queue it in, so whatever. They brought their driveway just off of that. <coughs> the other the other developer or most recent one did not have to fill it as e either. They chose to do the extra cost and, and widen it themselves. Okay, they were going to be doing a lot of driveways and, and culverts and. And it is nice yeah. because the traffic, like you know what I mean, if they're parked on Sunday. They weren't expecting that swamp feature to be seven days a week. But even for their own, even for their own uh, four or eight buildings, yeah. they didn't have to uh, infill the existing ditch to do the development. Okay, thank you, I just sir. If they're building a public street as part of their development, right. they have to. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I was just going to ask, I wonder if, I know we have a bylaw and it says crosswalks shouldn't or can't be in place unless it's intersection to intersection. Is that? We don't have a bylaw. We don't. But it's, it's usually recommended that that not happen. A review a few years ago and created a policy document, I'll say, yep. that we have used as a guideline. Yeah. So in some of these instances where, you know, there's sort of, there's a residential, we'll call it a development, I mean, there's four, six, eight buildings. Yeah. Is it worth taking a look at some of these on a case by case basis as to whether a crosswalk might be yeah, there's, the there's, answer as opposed to not having a crosswalk? It's, and I guess I say, we have a policy there, but the other Underlying part is there's an actual, just like we put in a left turn and signal or a set of signals, there's warrants, it's called, there's a procedure. There's actually a, a, a crosswalk warrants as well, where it goes through an actual process that they're being all looked at consistently. So there is an actual traffic analysis done to determine if there's a warrant for a crosswalk. Yeah, right, okay. Because the city obviously is building. There's these big, not a lot of single family homes going up anymore. There's a lot of these row houses, yeah. and I think it's worth taking a look. We're not gonna, it's, it's unrealistic to, assume that we're going to build sidewalks everywhere. So I, I just think maybe now is the time or soon is the time to think about maybe if tech services, police services recommend some of these, taking a look at maybe putting crosswalks in some of these locations that traditionally wouldn't have one. It, and it's not, like I say, it's not flat out no on mid block, like there's, there's some areas that they are, but whenever the demand is there and they meet yeah. the warrants. Yeah. And I mean, and this one being a good example, lots of seniors and a busy road with the crosswalk opposite. And what we were explaining to Councillor Cameron prior is that when that development builds up a higher density, your warrants are going to be there to justify putting yeah. it. It won't, it'll be mid block on the Kewlin, but it'll be opposite at least, you know, the new street now, Foxland and Craig. So you'll, the other part is putting them in there. It's also where the traveling public are expecting to see them. We're not putting 40,000 set of flashers at every one of these ones that are there. Of course. They're typically at intersections where the general public realize, okay, there's practically going to be a crosswalk here. Look out for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think residents would understand that, you know, they might have to walk 20 feet on the, on the shoulder as opposed yep. to, you know, having a crosswalk right at their front door. I, I think they're, there would be some really acceptance walking, to that. They're really going to be walking half of a typical block either way, yeah. depending yeah. on where they are to get to it, if there's a crosswalk. At, I guess if there's nothing else, we will uh, move to adjourn the tech services meeting. Councillor Snow, he kind of had a look in your eye that you had something, but happy birthday. So we'll, uh, we'll adjourn, uh, adjourn tech services for this evening and, uh, and we'll move on. Thanks very much. Thank everybody. you, Councillor Drawn. Okay, I believe Councillor Adams, you're up next with the policy review yeah. and bylaws. Thank you, Your Worship. So I just wanted to bring forward um, public meeting notifications. And um, I've run into an issue just lately where some um, have been advertised on our social media and some have not. Um, and it was not received very well um, in regard to the fairness for um, residents knowing about what's going on. Um, in the bylaw, like I don't know if this um, is where it would be, like in CS2, 
the meeting notifications where like in 29.4 it says refer to section 7 and 7.2 it says that meeting notifications are on the city's website. So is it a matter of us having to add um, social media to that as well, an amendment to the bylaw in order to make sure it's consistent? Would that be the best? way to do it to make sure that it, that would certainly be one way to do it I, I, I think what has happened is the staff have met the requirements mm -hmm. right and yep. then usually I think the, the notifications also been added to social mm -hmm. media as a I'll say a heightened level yep. of yep. right awareness and so in the instance where you're speaking of it it didn't for whatever reason yep. I think a mistake or somebody was sick or something but you're right, it's, it hasn't been part of the mm -hmm. official process, it's yep. been a little more ad hoc, so yeah, that, yeah. That, adding it to the bylaw would be one way to do it for sure. Okay. Uh, another would be to give staff direction to. Yeah, yep. so um, it's, it's staff take the direction from the policy that's in place now to put it on the website, so if we just add that bit to it, then oh. it would cover um, the direction having to be given because yeah. they automatically put it on the website because that's the policy. So if we just add social media platforms yeah. to that, then it, it takes the pressure off, did I do it or did I not for one because it's just your checklist and it's, yeah. it's done. Can I speak? Yeah. yeah. I ahead. think um, maybe a month or two ago, we t did we talk, we talked about this, right? In, in, um, uh, whether how we were going to get the information out there because Salt Wire just has once a week now mm -hmm. that they're, and then the Guardian. And, and so I, I remember that conversation and I think we talked about maybe having Lisa or someone just directing them to add that to, to the, you know, our post on whether it be Facebook or the city post or whatever. And maybe that could be, you know, and, and I guess we, when we did talk about it, we just didn't come up with a conclusion, I believe, because um, if we would have. So Do you remember the conversation? Yeah, and I think uh, what happened was it was when the journal went from being daily to the to once Exactly. Week, then we were like, okay, we're going to have to put it in the Guardian. So I think that's when we sort of started talking about social, social media. media. Yeah. I Pardon? think it's an idea, a but good idea for sure. If we just put it in and then it's there and then it takes the pressure off of staff to um, not to have to remember, did I ask Lisa to do it? It's just an automatic, get, has to get done. So are you talking about just changing the policy or adding it to the bylaw? Well, in, I, my laptop went dead, but in the CS2 in section seven and 7.2, it says in the media I or on the website, but can we just add like social media platforms as well as the website to that line? Uh, that's I didn't buy a lot. Yeah. I, 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 I think it really should be entrenched in the bylaw as opposed to just yeah. direct it to the staff. Yeah, it was bylaw CS-2 and then section. Then it's, then it's a requirement. Yep. And, and uh, right now the provincial, yeah. our portion as far as Provincial Act. That's the amount of days. No, Provincial Act says we post it. What's in the what the wording is in the media? We as a bylaw, what one step further says, we will we will post it in the media. And the reason it went from the journal to the Guardian is that if someone walks in, and if we miss the meeting or the uh, publishing date for being in the journal weekly their application could go another week until it actually gets in the post and then there's so many days after that. So we did it, it got shifted to the daily, didn't get shifted, it shifted to the source, it still is in the daily paper. That's the, what's required on the Planning Act. Our bylaw went one step further and says, we notify property owners within a certain distance. Like the one you just had today was a variance, it's 30 meters. If it's a rezoning, it's 60 meters. If anybody that's about it, that's the landowner. I know one of the last ones was an issue that it was people that didn't know the land, didn't know what happened. You know, they didn't get notification. They didn't get a letter, which is one step higher than the Planning Act. The notification still was posted, but we don't have a, we get our data updated from the province on a 
bi-weekly and monthly data if you sell your house by the time it gets registered. We actually will be able to automatically with the computer pick that property and get a listing of the current property owners. And right or wrong, that's who we know is there. Bruce is renting your place. He may be not really caring about the way he's out it goes on because he's just a renter there, whereas you as the landowner long term. So that's why I think it goes to the landowner and we don't have a current database of who the renters are. So that's the means of getting it out to the, so that's the two steps we do. Beyond that, I don't know, I don't want to speak for Brian or the CEO to say what gets published when and what meeting dates are and, and, and uh, what the topics are and content. We just do what we're required under the act to make sure we're covering off ourselves so that your decisions are defendable and, and we're trying to do it in a consistent manner so that it's defendable. You know, what you guys do is posting meeting data and meeting dates and I don't know anything of that. We don't, so what I can say, that's a current internal policy you have with others. We do what's mandated there to. I think there's just things for council to consider, right? Are, are methods to notify people, right? And, and putting social media into the bylaw will more than likely increase the notification scope, right? Which is positive, right? It will also, um, it'll also create a, a higher state, like we'll be putting a higher standard onto ourselves that if we don't meet it for whatever reason, we'll be open for appeal. So that's, so that's something for council to at least know and consider before they. Like yesterday when Facebook was down. For instance, is for, that well, something? Well, for instance, right. Like, I mean, there's your balance, I would assume you're balancing the minimum standard versus, right, the minimum standard of whatever the planning act says, yeah. right? And we've, we've already said we're gonna increase that minimum standard because we notify X, Y, and Z a certain radius, yeah. right? If, if we want to make another decision, say we want to again increase that standard by mandating social media, that's fine for sure. But just you need to be aware that it's we're increasing the rules on ourselves and if we miss them for whatever reason, you may have more exposure to an appeal. But Facebook's but not down that often, so. Not, <laughs> yeah. But if, if it's entrenched in bylaw, we then shouldn't miss it. we shouldn't miss it. Nope. A responsibility, and I think you can build wording into that to protect against you know the base books being down mm -hmm. and that it, type and of it's stuff. It's human yeah. nature, things are going to get missed sometimes. Yeah. We, yeah. we yeah. miscalculated yeah. dates because, before, uh, and had you know, it's a valid point. I mean, we've uh, it, it just, yeah, whenever you make rules to govern yourself, right. you should yeah. be understand what the, yeah. what the consequences are if we miss them. But to me, if we're really serious about notifying people as best as we possibly can then we entrenched in the bylaw. Yep. So if we put it in that yeah. section 7.2, if we add that to 7.2, then? I would suggest that at the bylaw policy yep. review committee, we should, as a committee, take a look, make yep. sure we figure out everywhere in all the bylaws yep. that might have to be amended, Refer and then we it. can yep. get a checklist ready of what needs to be amended and move forward with that. Councilor Shaw? I, I think it's a great discussion. Anytime we can get more information out, I think we need to, um, without opening up uh, the discussion too much, the issue that sort of brought this forward, I think there's more that could be flushed out for us as a municipality or, or our residents as well because the issue has to do with the landowner that you're talking about. We notified the landowner. Um, in this particular situation, Although we notified the landowner on those lands, there's also individual owners of and have investments in trailers, mobile homes. Um, I, I think we need to look at in those instances where there's actually a landowner plus on that land uh, uh, owner of a property or, or a structure that both should be notified because they both have a interest in what might happen next. And I, I don't know how that will work or right. if it can work. And that's where we're at. There's no gear. We have no way of knowing who lives in mini home number 77 and 83. Okay. We have zero. But we did notify, if that was such a big issue, to the landowner, they wrote a two-page letter. They have a listing of all their tenants to justify and say, that's a big issue to us. They wrote a two-page letter. They listed six things that they want considered. Did they notify their landowners to make sure, you know, we're doing our, all right, 
they'll be I, well, I notified that one and I didn't notify that one it's like well or I don't have Facebook and I don't have Twitter or who am I like you know we're going to that to that means that's where you're held into as Gordon mentioned we're doing the act and we're doing one step beyond that if you want to do something else they are trying to do something uh, you know as much as they can or 99 times out of 100 and in this, when I say 99 out of 100 99 out of 100 you are identifying the homeowner and rarely is it it's only that instance where it's a mini home park that you're getting the people that are don't own the land right. you know that's the no, one and, of an and, and that's I guess that's why I brought it up it's not a it's a very it's small uh, number that I think we could easily consider doing as a municipality even though we might not know I don't know how it's registered in our system. It's all under PID, probably whatever who owns the trailer park. But we we must have some. There must be some sort of information on who has each property. You would think, or maybe maybe not. I, I don't know. I just I just think there's a value in at least looking at that because I think that's what's starting to rear its head here now is that individual people, rightfully so, who have an investment, um, are like, what's going on beside me here? And I I was notified, but I, I, we did notify the landowner. It, they yeah. probably should. And the one that's coming to it, like, it's not a, a game we're going to one of. Yeah. The last three days, there's been one going on back and forth with emails. And I'm in the process of sending with the email with the map that shows everybody that was notified. And you weren't. But here, at least, he's saying nobody was notified. I went around to everybody. We're going to send the map tomorrow and say, a year ago, that was exactly who was notified. Okay. You know, like. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so what I'll do is we'll take it to BPR committee and then we'll and take it back and in the meantime if any individual counselors have suggestions or whatever just email it to me and then I'll take those all forward on with me. Is this the same situation like notifying the landlord with the uh, 12 tenants in the building? You just notify the landlord, you don't notify the 12 tenants. Correct. So besides you're talking mobile park, you know the others should be taken into consideration as well. I, I think Councilor Snow was saying the people that actually own the mini home have a bigger vested interest in someone that's renting an apartment. Right. I think that was what he was the, yeah, not that, speaking for. But. No, no, that's exactly it, Aaron. I, I just, I think we're to a point now, if you're a renter in an apartment building, um, obviously you have an interest in it just because what's around you, but uh, financially you're, you're renting, you're not, you don't own the property. Where in the mobile home parks, for, or the majority of them, you're actually investing in a structure. Um, we know now how significant those investments can be now with the Price of some some mobile homes, so I I think they're understandably so um, they have a more invested interest I, I think so and I don't know if there's a way to uh, look into that or how that could be done but I just I think it's worth mentioning and some of those could be rented as well. Exactly. So what did we decide here? In We're going to take it to the bylaw policy review committee and individual councillors can send me their recommendations. I'll take everything to bylaw committee and then we'll come back to council with the uh, recommendations. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor? Adams, is that all you have? Okay, we'll move on to the birthday, Councillor. Happy birthday, Councillor Snow. Birthday. Enjoy your day and your cake and, uh, and yeah. with your family and friends. I don't, I don't eat cake, so but I've had a good day for sure. I remember when I was 29. Yeah, and, uh, it's a happy birthday. I don't know if I remember when I was 29, but uh, I wish I was. So uh, we'll turn it over to you and your busy department. Thank Community you. Services. Uh, Community services, uh, we have a couple items on the agenda. Uh, number one here is bowling lanes. Uh, uh, sort of Councillor Adams had, had asked for it to be put on the agenda. I don't know if you want to speak at all to it. Councillor Adams first, and I definitely have an update. So. Yep, yeah. if you want to update, the question came from residents um, just regarding um, bowling lane repairs and the time it was taking to get them done and so on. Like, um, So um, count, I took it to Councillor Snow, and he followed up with Director DeRosier, so he has an update on that. Yeah, so uh, during the summer months, a, a resident of Summerside reached out to me with some uh, concerns about uh, some bowling lanes that might have been uh, needing repairs uh, and immediately I uh, spoke with uh, Director DeRoger and uh, they put their staff to work making sure and, and looking at all the uh, bowling lanes. Uh, they did do uh, some repairs uh, and have ordered a significant amount of parts to do some repairs obviously 
the easy excuse is COVID, but but there's an actual realistic part to that. Uh, it, it had caused some delays in getting some parts and some repairs done, um, but our staff have uh, them up and running right now. So of the eight, uh, six of them are running. The other two are in needing of some significant parts and parts are ordered. Um, so the six right now, I think that's enough to have our bowling uh, leagues running and uh, for our public to use um, is the information I'm getting back from the department. So so all the needed work that's needed is, is getting done. The parts are on order and, and being uh, delivered hopefully sooner rather than later, but, but definitely we want all our facilities up in top-notch shapers as good as they can be working so um, the the concerns that were brought forward were addressed with the community service department and they've uh, directed staff to get their repairs done so that's uh, an update on the bowling lanes if there's any questions or other concerns and next up on the agenda we have the Summerside Golf Course uh, Councillor McFeely requested this be put on I I think uh, all of us lately have probably uh, fielded some calls from residents and had some discussions. Uh, I'll let Councillor McFeely uh, start it off and then we'll open the floor if there's any questions or comments. Okay, thank you, Councillor Snow. And uh, I, I did ask this to be put on. I, I, full disclosure here though, first, I, I, I have been a member of the, the course there for many, many years up to the last couple of years where I, I haven't taken a membership out, but bypasses instead just simply because I don't have the time to be out there as much as I'd like to be. But um, so I certainly want to disclose that. So, uh, you know, and, and as a resident who's been a member there for a number of years, and uh, it's extremely disappointing to see the course going to be closed for a period of time. Um, and, and we're a little unclear of what that might be, one or two years, whatever, whatever it is. Um, um, and I know most councillors have uh, had a number of calls on this from residents expressing their, their disappointment. Uh, residents that use the course on a regular basis and, uh, and they are quite upset and, and I, you know, they, I think it's an understatement to say they're upset, they, they are very upset. Um, uh, and I think most of them recognize that the city um, have no authority over the golf course um, or its ownership. Uh, the city never owned the course at any point in time, although it was a minor shareholder in the uh, Somerset Area Development Corporation that did own the course at, at one point in time. Um, having said that, uh, although we have no ownership or authority over the course, I, I, I firmly believe that the city, we have a, an advocacy role not only an advocacy role, but an obligation to to support our residents and uh, and encourage the ownership to keep the closure to a minimum period, um, and to assure it reopens as a public course at an affordable price to residents. Um, there's really nothing we can do about the past and how we got here. I, I, I think you know to, to spend time talking about that is. Uh, is not going to get us um, uh, where we need to get to. I believe we need to focus on the future and do all we can to assure that the course remains public and affordable to uh, the citizens of Summerside going forward. Um, a number of councillors and staff were present on uh, August 13th when we had a tour of the resort, and I think that it's safe to say that uh, most were uh, pretty pleased and impressed with what they what they saw and the changes and the work that was done and the progress on the interior of the resort. Uh, since some of you, I wasn't there last year when you had the tour, but there's been a, you know significant work done inside there. So I think people were were fairly impressed with that. And you will recall that during the question and answer period to, at the conclusion of that tour, the closure of the course came up. And I specifically asked the owner of the course, would it reopen as a public course once the improvements were made? And he clearly indicated that that would be the case and that it would reopen as a public course when it reopened. So, so tonight I, I asked for it to be on the agenda and I'm hopeful that council will agree that we direct the mayor to send a letter to the owner seeking confirmation that one, the course 
uh, upgrade would be complete as quickly as possible to ensure it reopens in a timely manner, hopefully after only one year of closure. Two, that the course would reopen as a public course accessible to the citizens of Summerside and area. And three, that the membership rate would remain affordable to the citizens of Summerside when it does reopen. So, so that's why I asked it to be on the agenda tonight to, um, for, to get council's concurrence to direct the mayor to write that letter to confirm, uh, you know, with with the owner that uh, what he said in the in in our meeting with him back in August that it would reopen as a public course and and that it um, we we certainly never talk about uh, didn't talk about the uh, the affordability of it at that time, but it would be. Hopeful, I think that should be addressed in the letter that when it does reopen, membership rates aren't outrageous. So, um. thank you, Councillor McFeely, for that. Uh, Your Worship, your light was on first. Uh. Oh, sorry, I guess it's, I think Brian keeps it on all the oh. time here. Oh, but, but anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor McFeely, for those comments. And most of us were there for that meeting with the owner, and uh, I thought it was fairly positive. He did indicate that. He was going to close it for a year for construction purposes. I think he's going to build a new uh, golf club building. I think that's what he said. And uh, yeah. that he uh, would be reopening after the year. Or I think he said after the year. And uh, uh, there's no question uh, we want to keep it open. We want to keep it open here, even though it's outside the city limits. And when it was sold a number of years ago, it was sold. The province had 75% of where the uh, ownership of. Uh, SRDC, which they controlled, and uh, but anyway, they sold it to a local developer or business person, and then two or three or four or five years ago, it was sold to, to this gentleman. Anyway, uh, or the owner of the spa resort or whatever it's called now, Royal Ocean View, Royal Ocean View, or something like that. But anyway, Prince, uh, Prince Alex, right? Mm -hmm. Royal, Royal Alex, Royal Alex. But uh, let's hope that it, it is opened shortly after the construction and uh, because it's great for tourism in Summerside, it's great for the golfers that live in the area. And, um, and I understand I'm not a golfer. I could just never, it was like Councillor McPhee, I just could never gather up five or six or seven or eight hours, whatever it takes to go around. It usually take me a little longer than everybody else. It's, it's not a straight walk for me any time I did go. <laughs> but uh, we will do whatever we can to, to uh, and, and certainly that letter will be sent to the owner. And uh, uh, I know that con he's continuously working on the hotel. Uh, when we were there meeting with him, I think there were close to 40 people working there, carpenters, electricians, and drywall people, and whatever. And uh, so it's great to see that the work is ongoing, but it will be great to see the opening, whenever that is. But uh, uh, he, he told us that he would reopen the golf course when the construction was finished there. And I think he figured it'd be a year. But uh, so, but we will certainly keep on it and do whatever we can, even though we don't own it and it's not within the city, but we understand how important it is for our industry and tourism and, uh, and uh, some jobs that, that are there. Thank you, uh, Councillor Snow. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Adams. Um, thank you. Um, I guess there's just a few things that um, I said I would bring forward that people had asked me. So I said in public, we will get this all out in the air. Um, like um, you had said, Your Worship, it isn't in the city. It's just in outside the boundaries. Putters Lane is inside the city. So that's where the divide is. Um, so any um, permits, etc., would be provincial. Um, so there's nothing you have said, Your Worship, um, you mentioned, there is nothing right now that the city is responsible for with the ownership. It was, we were a small shareholder when it was with SRDC, but right. after that, the city had nothing right. to do with it, correct? Okay. And, um, there was a question regarding a loan, and if a loan had that was guaranteed, I believe was the term used by the city, had been paid off, or if that was still outstanding. Yeah. That no, was paid there, within a year. Was, yeah. There was no loan. It was, no. A, it, it, 
my recollection is it was a loan guarantee yeah. yep. uh, that was covered off by a significant piece of land as collateral. Right. Uh, there was absolutely no risk to the city no. around that, and it was paid off well within the time frame. Just that months it was after we did paid it. Off. So. Yeah. Those were the things that were brought to me right. so in passing. So I said, well, we'll just ask them because I'm sure a few of you are in the same boat as me. I wasn't here when dealings went down. So I have to ask as many questions as other people because you know how stories get going and so on. So get little pieces and put them together and it doesn't always actually end up what happened. Um, yeah, so that's all I had other than um, in addition to like the jobs um, that you know are impacted, um, youth jobs as well as um, seasonal jobs. Um, there's also the junior program that now our kids have to drive, you know, a minimum of 20 minutes to at least 20 minutes to get to another golf course to enjoy a, a junior program. So, yeah, I definitely support a letter being sent. So thank you for bringing thank you, that Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Ramsey. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Snow. <laughs> Um, I as well did that tour on August 13th, um, and it's, it's, it's very, very beautiful. Um, part of the conversation was that the, um, after the tour, was that the golf course was going to be closed for a year, and that it was going to be, again, I say this, this resort is very high end, and if they take that same initiative, and put it into this golf course. We will have a very, very beautiful golf course here in Summerside, which will be really, really nice for us. And um, there was no talk of any extension except for the year when, when uh, we asked the question. It was going to be closed for a year and it would be back up and running. I am getting a great education because I didn't know the history of our golf course and the involvement with the city and how much we were involved and 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 I and I certainly realize the importance of having the golf course here in Summerside. So I also know that um, in meeting with Mr. Liu and his wife, they were very very lovely and easy to communicate with, and I think that as a city. Hopefully, we're going to be able to have a nice conversation with them and, and um, share with them the importance of having this golf course for Summerside and that it is affordable, uh, Councillor McFeely, and you know um, all the things that, that Summerside needs that they can, um, they can have that for us there at, at the Summerside Golf Course. And so that's, that's really all I have to say. I'm really hopeful that within a year, that we get that course back and, and can pick up where we, you know, we lost a lot of economic uh, rebound from not having that uh, course here. So I'm hoping that uh, that only happens for the year. And that's all I have. Thank you. Councilor McDougall. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Brian, for bringing this to the meeting tonight. I do agree with the uh, three questions uh, that are being posed in the letter. Uh, and just to uh, go back to the SRDC piece, uh, the, the city was 15%. I believe the chamber was 10, was it not? Yep. And the province was 75. And the chamber, or not the chamber, but the SRDC, they, they purchased, of course, before I was there. I had served a term on the SRDC, but they had purchased the course, did all kinds of improvements to it, and sold it, and that was their mandate. That was what SRDC was supposed to do, and they sold it to reputable people, and, and uh, you know, uh, we have no control over who, who buys it or who sells it, as it is outside the city of Summerside, but it's in a very important uh, part of our, our community and has been for years. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can have a conversation with uh, Mr. Liu and uh, minimize the uh, pain that it's gonna be to uh, close it for whatever length of time we need. So hopefully uh, 
the shortest time possible. So, thank you. And I know that he's got, uh, and he told us out there, he's got a, a very, a lot of plans uh, to bring this uh, course up, not not just to replace the, not just to replace the uh, watering system, but it's to bring this course up to another level too. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor McDougall. You, Your Worship. Thank you. I'll just sum up here. And you're right, uh, Deputy Mayor, or Councillor McDougall, uh, back when the SRDC bought it, I'm just trying to remember back in the 70s, I would guess. Yeah. I think they bought it from a local entrepreneur lady, Sally Basler, right. I think was the owner. And uh, the, she sold it to the SRDC, and as was mentioned, 75% owned by the province. And then what uh, uh, I think uh, Councillor Adams had mentioned the, the last term when I was on vacation, uh, I guess there was a, some sign of a, sort of arrangements made, but as Councillor McFeely said, the city has absolutely no contact, no connection to it at this time. That loan or whatever was guaranteed was written off, and by, and so there's no ownership. Pardon? Paid off in months. Men, in months, yeah. So, anyway, and it's in the village of Linkletter, I believe, or the community of Linkletter presently. But we'll continue to pursue to have the resort complete as well as make sure that the, or try our best to make sure that the golf course uh, stays open or opens after the construction work and uh, I understand it's still open at this point and uh, you never know what could happen over the winter maybe it even though we're hearing it's going to be closed and I think he made that statement that for a year but you never know what could happen over the winter that maybe it won't uh, but who knows but anyway, that's my uh, Reader's Digest version, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Your Worship. So just, just to sum up, uh, Your Worship, you're going to send a letter from Mayor and Council with yes. the three questions as indicated. Um, uh, just on my own, I definitely received lots of uh, questions from residents and, and uh, totally understand their concern. And, and I think it's fair to say uh, you know, we, we, we have seen some improvements because we did a couple tours over at Ocean View, but residents of Summerside still have not seen the end product that probably has been promised to them over many years. So I, I can tell you, um, I personally understand exactly what they're feeling when they say what's going to happen here um, because we, we've heard lots of what's going to happen here and not not come to fruition right so so my hope is that we'll get a response back from the letter and I, I think it would be prudent for us to meet with Mr. Liu and and his representatives just to have a really good understanding um, so he can hear from us what it means to our residents in the city of Summerside and the economy and uh, particularly I, I had a conversation the other day and I, I think one uh, Councillor Adams just mentioned the juniors and I, I never even thought of I never thought of that I, I was thinking of our seniors and you know them getting out getting active and what that means to them but Councillor Adams just mentioned our juniors and how that's going to impact parents and so on during the summer trying to get them wherever so so once you start thinking about it there's a number of ripple effects so I just think it's very prudent that we have that conversation sooner rather than later but thank, thank you. you that letter will be going out and speaking of golf but it's great to, I don't think I'm telling tales of the school but there's a new golf simulator business it's uh, being set up now, and I saw it the other day. I, and, uh, I, timing is good. It's going to be great for the winter months, but uh, thank I, you, and we'll ensure that letter goes out in the next uh, short period I of see, time. I seen that post, too, the other day, and I, I think you're right. I think it's going to fit very nicely with the other uh, projects down in by Credit Union Place, let's yeah, say. Yeah, I did, I did go in, and I saw it there, and it yeah. is, it's uh, first class. Perfect. So uh, that's everything that's on the community service agenda. With that, I'll ask for adjournment. Thank you, Councillor Snow, and uh, continue on celebrating your birthday. How are we doing here? We're getting down to electrical? I didn't miss any items, did I? Councillor we'll Councillor Greg Campbell, did you have uh, electrical? We did. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Campbell, uh, oh. your floor is yours, and I guess you turn it over to... I'll Councilor be the honorary chair. This you're on for comments or questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor uh, Campbell, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had asked that this uh, be put on the agenda tonight, um, notifications of, uh, of power outages. I think it's going to be quick. I promise we'll get out of here before the, 
Red Sox Yankees game at 9:08. Um, so I guess really what uh, what brought me to uh, to put this on was during our last power outage, our last planned power outage. Um, I had a couple of messages. One from somebody who worked at the uh, hospital, who uh, was unaware. Actually, they said their whole department was unaware that there was going to be a power outage. Um, they don't blame the city for that, neither do I. They, they think somebody higher up probably was notified and just didn't let staff know. But regardless, you know, it involved them having to, uh, you know, quickly scramble to unplug vaccine refrigerators and things like that and, and plug into backup power and et cetera, et cetera. Hospital certainly a place that you don't want to catch off guard with power outage. But again, they don't blame the city. I certainly don't either. And right off the bat, actually, before I continue, I'd like to commend, I think it's probably Pauline Dicey, who always sends us emails well in advance of power outages, why it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. Um, and I think she makes the posts on Facebook as well, or very detailed. Maps are always included. Great. Um, so got to throw that out there. Um, also, at the last time we had a, a planned power outage, I received a message from someone who was f reliant, basically, on, on uh, specific metal equi medical equipment, um, you know, at night. Rather, the, I'm not sure what it was either. You know, maybe it's a CPAP machine or something or oxygen. Um, and they weren't notified. Um, since that happened, I was uh, talking with. Uh, I brought it up to CIO Rob, and I was made aware that uh, the city does have a lot of methods of notifications, and they're excellent. They're social media. They're on our website. Um, you can sign up for email notifications right on our website. At the bottom, it says notify me, and you can. Um, there's an email there that you send. It would be nice to have that just as a form as opposed to you actually have to send somebody an email to request to, to be notified. It's kind of weird, but uh, in some cases, there's actually knocking on doors. Um, so it's not a matter of us not having the right procedures in place. I think it's just, it seems to me the people that would really benefit from these notifications that would need them the most are the people that may not have the access to social media. Um, which is really where the majority of people get face it. It's, it's Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, so I guess what I am maybe requesting is that, um, and also I forgot to say that I was talking to, I, I, think, I guess it was Gordon, and uh, on behalf of the fire chief, I think there is a, a phone registry that some, some of these people with medical equipment, they, they do get called as opposed to, uh, you know, email or social media. But I was just, I kind of wanted to present what the city has in place f as far as notifications go. Um, and I wanted to request, maybe if it's possible, uh, it seems to me a very efficient way of letting people know of all these options would be to send out a notice in the electric utility bills because electric utility, everybody gets them in the mail. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if there needs to be a conversation or a, a quick chat, but I don't think the city has a shortfall where, when it comes to notifying people of power outages. I think we do a lot. Um, we have notifications that go out even when tree trimming needs to be performed. So I don't think it's something that we lack, but a lot of people, unless they're you know, spoon-fed the methods that we have, they're not going to know that we have all of these great procedures in place. So I, I don't know. The, what came to my mind was a notice in the, in the electri electricity bill because everybody gets one. It's not like you need internet to get your bill unless, I mean, I, I think some people probably signed up for paperless. But, you know, those that aren't are the ones that need this in the first place. So. I don't know, I, that's, that's what I have, and that's why I put it on the agenda, and uh, if anybody has anything to add, then stand up.
fantastic. But again, I wanted to commend the people that do put the notifications out there online. They're 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 spot on. They're perfect. They they have all the information needed. But it's just some people may not have the Facebook or even in some cases email. And those are the people I think that probably need these the most. Are the, are the people that don't. They're the seniors or who might not have Facebook, etc. Did you also get the email from Director Gray explaining? Yeah, that? there was an email sent from uh, Gordon from Director Goody, who, who actually said all the things that we have in place to notify people. And it's a very thorough list, mm -hmm. it is. But some of them require people to you know, sign up for. Or, and so unless people know that they can do that, then they may be missing out on some of these And just so people things. feel safer, I think that the counselor and the fire chief spent some time also on their calling list. That's one. Of, do you mind, Gary? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just have a note out to um, Chief Ron right now because with the emergency plan that we have in place, and and you know we've had many conversations around this type of thing, um, Justin, that um, he started a, a list um, of folks who, whether they're on oxygen or you know that that. Um, they would that they would reach out to and I, and I, I know there's a number of lists around but it's sometimes people get missed and we don't want to ever want that to happen so I know that he and I think he and you were kind of talked about that as well you and the chief did you or very not? very briefly just the fact that 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 it's something, it something that you would yeah, yeah. yeah so anyway I just have a note out to him and when I hear back then I'm going to talk yeah. again but I'm going to let you go here Gary there you go no, no thank you um, I guess also it's important to remember that not all our residents are on city utilities, so we have to ensure that Maritime Electric is also doing the same on that end. I do believe from what I've heard from a couple of residents that they do get a phone call from Maritime Electric stating that there is going to be an outage. So obviously they would have had to register for something in advance. Um, like you said, um, Councillor Justin, the same people that probably don't get their e-billing are the same people that probably won't see it online. So whether it be like a little banner on our e-billing or um, uh, a handout in the, in the actual paper copy, I think that's a really good idea. Um, yeah, other than that, I think it's, and sometimes the confusion between 12 o'clock Saturday is that's like 12 it's going out at 12 a.m. is that Saturday or Sunday it sometimes causes some confusion and anyways yeah you sort of have to sit and think for a minute is it Saturday or Sunday but usually anyways and people will forget we do send them out in lots like Pauline and the crew are great to send it out in lots of notice and we try and keep sharing it up until that day but either way Thank you, and thank you, Justin, for bringing that up. Now is the time to go over those things, not after something happens. So that's thank rude. you very much, and I guess that's it. You're well, I just wanted to say, uh, no, that's okay, um, Councillor Campbell. I did hear back from the chief, and he said that is something that they are, they, they haven't started it, but they're interested in getting going at, at that project. So, um, Great. Yeah, I know there is a list, but I just thought maybe the fire department might have had some. I know they know some folks because they get calls in to say, you know, I am on and if anything happens. But um, to have an actual list of everybody, I think that's what the chief was hoping for. So anyway, I just uh, did hear back, so I just wanted and to I thank you very much. They must have, uh, they must know who the people are that have oxygen and stuff too because of fires, I would think. Thank you, everyone. I'm still. I got oh. one more. I'm sorry, I didn't. I got. I got so one more, much a couple of sentences. <laughs> Two hundred yeah. words or less. Um, and the other thing, I just sort of mentioned it before, but I was wondering if maybe uh, IT director Jason, like on our main website, at the very bottom of the screen, it says notify me. But it says, in order to get email notifications, you have to email someone. So which means you got to click there and write you know, who it's going to and the subject. To me, if it was a form that you just typed in your email and hit submit, it just seems like it would be a more user-friendly way to, to sign up for email notifications. But 
I guess that that's it. If somebody, if if council agreed, if we could get uh, like uh, somebody that whoever does the the handouts and the electric bill to just to, to list all the ways and methods that you can get on, whether it's a call list, if you don't have internet and you have medical equipment, you want to have a heads up. Then at least that'll put get the onus off the city to, you know, this is how you can get notified and. It's up to you to sign up for one of these things. That'll get the pressure off us when something does happen. Anyway, that's thank all you, I got. Uh, Councillor Grant, and uh, I'll just sum up with a couple of things here. I, I didn't mention it, but uh, the PEI annual meeting for the Federation of PEI Municipalities is going to be in Summerside this fall, and uh, I know our, our councillor is the president. And uh, it's been arranged for the credit union place at this point, and we get a fairly big room there, so we'll be able to follow all of the uh, regular health regulations to be our, our uh, distance and masks. And it's in, uh, I think, early November. And uh, so we look forward to that, and uh, our friends from across the province will be there. And also, I've been appointed as the director, one of the directors for the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, and there's one from each province. We have the mayor just recently elected in uh, Torbay, Newfoundland, from Newfoundland, and we have the mayor of Amherst, Dr. Coogan, who's one of the directors, as well as the mayor of Shediac, uh, Roger Casey, and I think most people met Mr. Casey, and a good friend from Truro, Mayor Mills. So, and our CAO is uh, Matt Kerrigan from Halifax, and uh, we're certainly looking forward to that meeting. It's going to be held in Charlottetown this month. The good mayor of Charlottetown, Mayor Brown, is the host. And uh, it, there's an interesting uh, agenda planned. And our very professional Mike Tosuska and Greg Goody will be making a presentation on our solar system to the Atlantic mayors. And we certainly look forward to that. Uh, uh, and they, they have that down, down to a T. And I believe in regards to the Atlantic mayors, the presidents from each Atlantic province, and Bruce being the island, We'll like to be there, and uh, from each municipality association from each province will be in attendance. So we're looking forward to that, and that's all I have at this point. Uh, you'll be attending, likely, a, a, a Mr. President. So we've gotten to the end of the agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved and seconded. Thank you very much. And Brian will get us disconnected from YouTube.